This recording is part of the Trinity School Audio Library. All recordings are created for educational purposes to support students with disabilities and are not for profit. Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Section 1, Part 2. I think it was Lessing who once said, These are things which must cause you to lose your reason, or you have none to lose. An abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. Even we psychiatrists expect the reactions of a man to an abnormal situation, such as being committed to an asylum, to be abnormal in proportion to the degree of his normality. The reaction of a man to his admission to a concentration camp also represents an abnormal state of mind. But judged objectively, it is a normal and, as will be shown later, typical reaction to the given circumstances. These reactions, as I have described them, began to change in a few days. The prisoner passed from the first to the second phase, the phase of relative apathy, in which he achieved a kind of emotional death. Apart from the already described reactions, the newly arrived prisoner experienced the tortures of other most painful emotions, all of which he tried to deaden. First of all, there was his boundless longing for his home and his family. This often could become so acute that he felt himself consumed by longing. Then there was disgust, disgust with all the ugliness which surrounded him, even in its mere external forms. Most of the prisoners were given a uniform of rags, which would have made a scarecrow elegant by comparison. Between the huts in the camp lay pure filth, and the more one worked to clear it away, the more one had to come in contact with it. It was a favorite practice to detail a new arrival to a work group whose job was to clean the latrines and remove the sewage. If, as usually happened, some of the excrement splashed into your face during its transport over bumpy fields, any sign of disgust by the prisoner or any attempt to wipe off the filth would only be punished with a blow from the capo, and thus the mortification of normal reactions was hastened. At first the prisoner looked away if he saw the punishment parades of another group. He could not bear to see fellow prisoners march up and down for hours in the mire, their movements directed by blows. Days or weeks later things changed. Early in the morning, when it was still dark, the prisoner stood in front of the gate with his detachment, ready to march. He heard a scream and saw how a comrade was knocked down, pulled to his feet again and knocked down once more. And why? He was feverish but had reported to sickbay at an improper time. He was being punished for this irregular attempt to be relieved of his duties. But the prisoner who had passed into the second stage of his psychological reactions did not avert his eyes any more. By then his feelings were blunted and he watched unmoved. Another example he found himself waiting at sickbay, hoping to be granted two days of light work inside the camp because of injuries or perhaps edema or fever. He stood unmoved while a twelve-year-old boy was carried in who had been forced to stand at attention for hours in the snow or to work outside with bare feet because there were no shoes for him in the camp. His toes had become frostbitten, and the doctor on duty picked off the black gangrenous stumps with tweezers one by one. Disgust, horror, and pity are emotions that our spectator could not really feel anymore. The sufferers, the dying and the dead, became such commonplace sights to him after a few weeks of camp life that they could not move him any more. I spent some time in a hut for typhus patients who ran very high temperatures and were often delirious, many of them moribund. After one of them had just died, I watched without any emotional upset the scene that followed, which was repeated over and over again with each death. One by one, the prisoners approached the still warm body. One grabbed the remains of a messy meal of potatoes. Another decided that the corpse's wooden shoes were an improvement on his own and exchanged them. A third man did the same with the dead man's coat, and another was glad to be able to secure some, just imagine, genuine string. All this I watched with unconcern. Eventually I asked the nurse to remove the body. When he decided to do so, he took the corpse by its legs, allowed it to drop into the small corridor between the two rows of boards which were the beds for the fifty typhus patients, and dragged it across the bumpy earthen floor toward the door. The two, the two steps which led up into the open air always constituted a problem for us, since they were exhausted from a chronic lack of food. After a few months' stay in the camp, we could not walk up those steps, which were each about six inches high, 
without putting our hands on the door jams to pull ourselves up. The man with the corpse approached the steps. Wearily, he dragged himself up. Then the body, first the feet, then the trunk, and finally, with an uncanny rattling noise, the head of the corpse bumped up the two steps. My place was on the opposite side of the hut, next to the small, sole window, which was built near the floor. While my cold hands clasped a bowl of hot soup from which I sipped greedily, I happened to look out the window. The corpse which had just been removed stared in at me with glazed eyes. Two hours before I had spoken to that man, now I continued sipping my soup. If my lack of emotion had not surprised me from the standpoint of professional interest, I would not remember this incident now because there was so little feeling involved in it. Apathy, the blunting of the emotions and the feeling that one could not care any more, were the symptoms arising during the second stage of the prisoner's psychological reactions, and which eventually made him insensitive to daily and hourly beatings. By means of this insensibility, the prisoner soon surrounded himself with a very necessary protective shell. Beatings occurred on the slightest provocation, sometimes for no reason at all. For example, bread was rationed out at our work site and we had to line up for it. Once the man behind me stood off a little to one side, and that lack of symmetry displeased the SS guard. I did not know what was going on in the line behind me, nor in the mind of the SS guard, but suddenly I received two sharp blows on my head. Only then did I spot the guard at my side who was using his stick. At such a moment it, did not, it is not the physical pain which hurts the most, and this applies to adults as much as to punished children. It is the mental agony caused by the injustice, the unreasonableness of it all. Strangely enough, a blow which does not even find its mark can, under certain circumstances, hurt more than one that finds its mark. Once I was standing on a railway track in a snowstorm. In spite of the weather, our party had to keep on working. I worked quite hard at mending the track with gravel, since that was the only way to keep warm. For only one moment I paused to get my breath and to lean on my shovel. Unfortunately, the guard turned around just then and thought I was loafing. The pain he caused me was not from any insults or any blows. That guard did not think it worth his while to say anything, not even a swear word to the ragged, emaciated figure standing before him, which probably reminded him only vaguely of a human form. Instead, he playfully picked up a stone and threw it at me. That, to me, seemed the way to attract the attention of a beast, to call a domestic animal back to its job, a creature which you have so little in common that you do not even punish it. The most painful part of beatings is the insult which they imply. At one time, we had to carry some long, heavy girders over icy tracks. If one man slipped, he endangered not only himself, but all the others who carried the same girder. An old friend of mine had a congenitally dislocated hip. He was glad to be capable of working in spite of it, since the physically disabled were almost certainly sent to death when a selection took place. He limped over the track with an especially heavy girder and seemed about to fall and drag the others with him. As yet I was not carrying a girder, so I jumped to his assistance without thinking to stop. I was immediately hit on the back, rudely reprimanded in order to return to my place. A few minutes previously, the same guard who struck me has told us deprecatingly that we pigs lack the spirit of comradeship. Another time in a forest, with the temperature at two degrees Fahrenheit, we began to dig up the topsoil, which was frozen hard, in order to lay water pipes. By then I had grown rather weak physically. Along came a foreman with chubby rosy cheeks. His face definitely reminded me of a pig's head. I noticed that he wore lovely warm gloves in that bitter cold. For a time he watched me silently. I felt that trouble was brewing, for in front of me lay the mound of earth which showed exactly how much I had dug. Then he began. You pig. I've been watching you the whole time. I'll teach you to work yet. Wait till you dig dirt with your teeth. You'll die like an animal. In two days I'll finish you off. You've never done a stroke of work in your life. What were you, swine? A businessman? I was past caring, but I had to take his threat of killing me seriously, so I straightened up and looked him directly in the eyes. I was a doctor, a specialist. What? A doctor? I bet you got a lot of money out of people. As it happens, I did most of my work for no money at all in clinics for the poor. But now I had said too much. He threw himself on me and knocked me down, shouting like a madman. I can no longer remember what he shouted. 
I want to show with this apparently trivial story that there are moments when indignation can rouse even a seemingly hardened prisoner. Indignation not about cruelty or pain, but about the insult connected with it. That time blood rushed to my head because I had to listen to a man judge my life who had so little idea of it. A man, I must confess, the following remark which I made to my fellow prisoners after the scene, afforded me childish relief, who looked so vulgar and brutal that the nurse in the outpatient ward in my hospital would not even have admitted him to the waiting room. Fortunately, the capo in my working party was obligated to me. He had taken a liking to me because I listened to his love stories and matrimonial troubles, which he poured out during the long marches to our work site. I had made an impression on him with my diagnosis of his character and with my psychotherapeutic advice. After that, he was grateful, and this had already been of value to me. On several previous occasions, he had reserved a place for me next to him in one of the first five rows of our detachment, which usually consisted of 280 men. That favor was important. We had to line up early in the morning while it was still dark. Everybody was afraid of being late and of having to stand in the back rows. If men were required for an unpleasant and disliked job, the senior capo appeared and usually collected the men he needed from the back rows. These men had to march away to another, especially dreaded kind of work under the command of strange guards. Occasionally, the senior capo chose men from the first five rows just to catch those who tried to be clever. All protests and entreaties were silenced by a few well-aimed kicks, and the chosen victims were chased to the meeting place with shouts and blows. However, as long as my capo felt the need of pouring out his heart, this could not happen to me. I had a guaranteed place of honor next to him. But there was another advantage, too. Like nearly all the camp inmates, I was suffering from edema. My legs were so swollen and the skin on them so tightly stretched that I could scarcely bend my knees. I had to leave my shoes unlaced in order to make them fit my swollen feet. There would not have been space for socks, even if I had had any. So my partly bare feet were always wet and my shoes always full of snow. This, of course, caused frostbite and chillblains. Every single step became real torture. Clumps of ice formed on our shoes during our marches over snow-covered fields. Over and again men slipped, and those following behind stumbled on top of them. Then the column would stop for a moment, but not for long. One of the guards soon took action and worked over the men with the butt of his rifle to make them get up quickly. The more to the front of the column you were, the less often you were disturbed by having to stop, and then to make up for lost time by running on your painful feet. I was very happy to be the personally appointed physician to his honor, the capo, and to march in the first row at an even pace. As an additional payment for my services, I could be sure that as long as soup was being dealt out at lunchtime at our work site, he would, when my turn came, dip the ladle right to the bottom of the vat and fish out a few peas. This capo, a former army officer, even had the courage to whisper to the foreman whom I had quarreled with that he knew me to be an unusually good worker. That didn't help matters, but he nevertheless managed to save my life, one of the many times it was to be saved. The day after the episode with the foreman, he smuggled me into another work party. There were foremen who felt sorry for us and who did their best to ease our situation, at least at the building site, but even they kept on reminding us that an ordinary laborer did several times as much work as we did, and in a shorter time, but they did see reason if they were told that a normal workman did not live on ten and a half ounces of bread, theoretically, actually, we often had less, and one and three quarter pints of thin soup per day, that a normal laborer did not live under the mental stress we had to submit to, not having news of our families who had either been sent to another camp or gassed right away, that a normal workman was not threatened by death continuously, daily and hourly. I even allowed myself to say once to a kindly foreman, if you could learn from me how to do a brain operation in as short a time as I learned this road work from you, I would have great respect for you. And he grinned. Apathy, the main symptom of the second phase, was a necessary mechanism of self-defense. Reality dimmed and all efforts and all emotions were centered on one task, preserving one's own life and that of the other fellow. It was typical to hear the prisoners while they were being herded back to camp from their work sites in the evening, sigh with relief and say, well, another day is over. It can be readily understood that such a state of strain 
coupled with the constant necessity of concentrating on the task of staying alive, forced the prisoner's inner life down to a primitive level. Several of my colleagues in camp who were trained in psychoanalysis often spoke of a regression in the camp inmate, a retreat to a more primitive form of mental life. His wishes and desires became obvious in his dreams. What did the prisoner dream about most frequently? Of bread, cake, cigarettes, and nice warm baths. The lack of having these simple desires satisfied led him to seek wish fulfillment in dreams. Whether these dreams did any good is another matter. The dreamer had to wake from them to the reality of camp life and to the terrible contrast between his and his dream illusions. I shall never forget how I was roused one night by the groans of a fellow prisoner who threw himself about in his sleep, obviously having a terrible nightmare. Since I had always been especially sorry for people who suffered from dreadful dreams or deliria, I wanted to wake the poor man. Suddenly I drew back the hand, which was ready to shake him, frightened at the thing I was about to do. At that moment I became intensely conscious of the fact that no dream, no matter how horrible, could be as bad as the reality of the camp which surrounded us and to which I was about to recall him. Because of the high degree of undernourishment which the prisoner suffered, it was natural that the desire for food was the major primitive instinct around which mental life centered. Let us observe the majority of prisoners when they happened to work near each other and were for once not closely watched. They would immediately start discussing food. One fellow would ask another working next to him in the ditch what his favorite dishes were, and then they would exchange recipes and plan the menu for the day when they would have a reunion, the day in a distant future when they would be liberated and returned home. They would go on and on, picturing it all in detail, until suddenly a warning was passed down the trench, usually in the form of a special password or number. The guard is coming. I always regarded the discussions about food as dangerous. Is it not wrong to provoke the organism with such detailed and effective pictures of delicacies when it has somehow managed to adapt itself to extremely small rations and low calories? Though it may afford momentary psychological relief, it is an illusion which, physiologically, surely must not be without danger. During the latter part of our imprisonment, the daily ration consisted of very watery soup given out once daily and the usual small bread ration. In addition to that, there was the so-called extra allowance, consisting of three-fourths of an ounce of margarine, or of a slice of poor quality sausage, or of a little bit of cheese, or a bit of synthetic honey, or a spoonful of watery jam, varying daily. In calories, this diet was absolutely inadequate, especially taking into consideration our heavy manual work and our constant exposure to the cold and inadequate clothing. The sick who were under special care, that is, those who were allowed to lie in the huts instead of leaving the camp for work, were even worse off. When the last layers of subcutaneous fat had vanished, and we looked like skeletons disguised with skin and rags, we could watch our bodies beginning to devour themselves. The organism digested its own protein, and the muscles disappeared. Then the body had no powers of resistance left. One after another, the members of the little community in our hut died. Each of us could calculate with fair accuracy whose turn would be next, and when his own would come. After many observations, we knew the symptoms well, which made the correctness of our prognosis quite certain. He won't last long, or this is the next one we whispered to each other, and when during our daily search for lice we saw our own naked bodies in the evening, we thought alike, this body here, my body, is really a corpse already. What has become of me? I am but a small portion of a great mass of human flesh, of a mass behind barbed wire crowded into a few earthen huts, a mass of which daily a certain portion begins to rot because it has become lifeless. I mentioned above how unavoidable were the thoughts about food and favorite dishes which were forced themselves into the consciousness of the prisoner, whenever he had a moment to spare. Perhaps it can be understood, then, that even the strongest of us was longing for the time when he would have fairly good food again, not for the sake of good food itself, but for the sake of knowing that the subhuman existence which had made us unable to think of anything other than food would at last cease. Those who have not gone through a similar experience can hardly conceive of the soul-destroying mental conflict and clashes of willpower which a famished man experiences. They can hardly grasp 
what it means to stand digging in a trench, listening only for the siren to announce 9.30 or 10 a.m., the half-hour lunch interval, when bread would be rationed out, as long as it was still available, repeatedly asking the foreman, if he wasn't a disagreeable fellow, what the time was, and tenderly touching a piece of bread in one's coat pocket, first stroking it with frozen, gloveless fingers, then breaking off a crumb and putting it in one's mouth, and finally, with the last bit of willpower, pocketing it again, having promised oneself that morning to hold out till afternoon. We could hold endless debates on the sense or nonsense of certain methods of dealing with the small bread ration, which was given out only once daily during the latter part of our confinement. There was two schools of thought. One was in favor of eating up the ration immediately. This had the twofold advantage of satisfying the worst hunger pangs for a very short time, at least once a day, and of safeguarding against possible theft or loss of the ration. The second group, which held with dividing up the ration, used different arguments. I finally joined their ranks. The most ghastly moment of the 24 hours of camp life was the awakening, when at a still nocturnal hour, the three shrill, shrill blows of a whistle tore us pitilessly from our exhausted sleep and from the longings in our dreams. We then began the tussle with our wet shoes, into which we could scarcely force our feet, which were sore and swollen with edema. And there were the usual moans and groans about petty troubles, such as the snapping of wires which replaced shoelaces. One morning I heard someone, whom I knew to be brave and dignified, cry like a child because he finally had to go to the snowy marching grounds in his bare feet, as his shoes were too shrunken for him to wear. In those ghastly minutes I found a little bit of comfort, a small piece of bread which I drew out of my pocket and munched with absorbed delight. Undernourishment, besides being the cause of the general preoccupation with food, probably also explains the fact that the sexual urge was generally absent. Apart from the initial effects of shock, this appears to be the only explanation of a phenomenon which a psychologist was bound to observe in those all-male camps. That as opposed to all other strictly male establishments, such as army barracks, there was little sexual perversion. Even in his dreams, the prisoner did not seem to concern himself with sex, although his frustrated emotions and his finer, higher feelings did find definite expression in them. With the majority of the prisoners, the primitive life and the effort of having to concentrate on just saving one's skin led to a total disregard of anything not serving that purpose, and explained the prisoners' complete lack of sentiment. This was brought home to me on my transfer from Auschwitz to a camp affiliated with Dachau. The train which carried us, about 2,000 prisoners, passed through Vienna. At about midnight, we passed one of the Viennese railway stations. The track was going to lead us past the street where I was born, past the house where I had lived many years of my life, in fact, until I was taken prisoner. There were 50 of us in the prison car, which had two small barred peepholes. There was only enough room for one group to squat on the floor, while the other, who had to stand up for hours, crowded around the peepholes. Standing on tiptoe and looking past the other's heads through the bars of the window, I caught an eerie glimpse of my native town. We all felt more dead than alive since we thought that our transport was heading for the camp at Mauthausen and that we had only one or two weeks to live. I had a distinct feeling that I saw the streets, the squares, and the houses of my childhood with the eyes of a dead man who had come back from another world and was looking down on a ghostly city. After hours of delay, the train left the station, and there was the street, my street, the young lads who had a number of years of camp life behind them and for whom such a journey was a great event, shared attentively through the people. I began to beg them, to entreat them to let me stand in front for one moment only. I tried to explain how much a look through that window meant to me just then. My request was refused with rudeness and cynicism. You lived here all those years. Well, then you've seen quite enough already. In general, there was also a cultural hibernation in the camp. There were two exceptions to this, politics and religion. Politics were talked about everywhere in camp, almost continuously. The discussions were based chiefly on rumors which were snapped up and passed around avidly. The rumors about the military situation were usually contradictory. They followed one another rapidly and succeeded only in making a contribution to the war of nerves that was waged in the minds of all the prisoners. Many times hopes for a speedy end to the war 
which had been fanned by optimistic rumors, were disappointed. Some men lost all hope, but it was the incorrigible optimists who were the most irritating companions. The religious interest of the prisoners, as far and as soon as it developed, was the most sincere imaginable. The depth and vigor of religious belief often surprised and moved a new arrival. Most impressive in this connection were improvised prayers or services in the corner of a hut, or in the darkness of the locked cattle truck in which we were brought back from a distant working site, tired, hungry, and frozen in our ragged clothes. In the winter and spring of 1945, there was an outbreak of typhus which infected nearly all the prisoners. The mortality was great among the weak, who had to keep on with their hard work as long as they possibly could. The quarters for the sick were most inadequate. There were practically no medicines or attendants. Some of the symptoms of the disease were extremely disagreeable, an irrepressible aversion to even a scrap of food, which was an additional danger to life, and terrible attacks of delirium. The worst case of delirium was suffered by a friend of mine who thought that he was dying and wanted to pray. In his delirium, he could not find the words to do so. To avoid these attacks of delirium, I tried, as did many of the others, to keep awake for most of the night. For hours, I composed speeches in my mind. Eventually, I began to reconstruct the manuscript which I had lost in the disinfection chamber of Auschwitz and scribbled the key words in shorthand on tiny scraps of paper. Occasionally, a scientific debate developed in camp. Once I witnessed something I had never seen, even in my normal life, although it lay somewhat near my own professional interests, a spiritualistic seance. I had been invited to attend by the camp's chief doctor, also a prisoner, who knew that I was a specialist in psychiatry. The meeting took place in his small private room in the sick quarters. A small circle had gathered, among them quite illegally, the warrant officer from the sanitation squad. One man began to invoke the spirits with a kind of prayer. The camp's clerk sat in front of a blank sheet of paper without any conscious intention of writing. During the next ten minutes, after which time the seance was terminated because of the medium's failure to conjure the spirits to appear... His pencil slowly drew lines across the paper, forming, quite legibly, V-A-E-V. It was asserted that the clerk had never learned Latin and that he had never before heard the words Vea Victus, woe to the vanquished. In my opinion, he must have heard them once in his life without recollecting them, and they must have been available to the spirit, the spirit of his subconscious mind, at that time a few months before our liberation and the end of the war. This recording is a ministry of the Trinity School, a culture-building enterprise focused on education, influence, industry, and the arts. To support this project, visit gracestaten.com slash trinityschool.